All right, folks, right, let's get started. Huh? Have a seat. Uh, we've got three speakers. This is the most speakers we've ever had for it to be a feature speaker. We had a couple of folks, for some reason, want to change the date to, to the day. Now, the problem with today on the marquee is because we have filing, I couldn't put the names up there because it would appear to be supporting a candidate. So I had to take that out because of the ethical problems that they appear. So. And Mr. Gaddix in green is uh, he's inspecting the door to make sure everything's working okay. Put on a sound to get out of here. <laughs> but Mr. Gaddix, our entertainment, I don't know what he's going to do. Now, as always, a lot of these things are impromptu. We never know exactly what's going to happen. So uh, that's part of the fun. But we have, before we get started, we have spent several uh, guests with us that uh, aren't, aren't necessarily featured speakers, but they don't have an opportunity to speak. I'd like to recommend, we've got Ross Snell, who's going to be helping with filing. Here, here, Ross. We've got the Honorable Bill West. And we've got Bill, let's get Bill West again. America, notice, um, I've got to show this to America. This is something I haven't seen in a while. And I don't know how many of, I've never used it this. It's an emergency kit with this real close. It's a, it's a cigarette and a, a match in a glass container. <laughs> Back when everybody was trying to quit. It says, in case of emergency, break the glass. <laughs> <laughs> so Mr. Gettings uh, apparently keeps that with him all the time, just in case. And I never did smoke. And here it is my cigarette. Me either. So we have the... Uh, we have se several uh, politicians, candidates with us today, but we also have uh, Congressman Joe Wilson's wife, Roxanne, with us. Roxanne, glad to have you here. Hey. Let's give Roxanne a hand. <laughs> now, we're not going to complain about how Joe votes on anything. Thank you. All I want to do is invite everybody to come to the campaign headquarters opening at 10 o'clock this morning. Okay. Today. All right. And we, we've got, at 12 noon, we have filing starts here. Uh, so a lot of the people I know will be here anyway. But we've got Clay Burkett, it's his first time running for any office. Clay, turn around and look at America and say hello. Hello, Mac. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got Honorable David James, former county councilman and still troublemaker here in the Casey area, in the county. Let's see. Uh, we've got another person running for school board. You want to say you're running for school board? I am running for school board. <laughs> since your husband controls the video, I'll oh, we'll school board. Period. Okay, there we go. We've got the third vice chair of the Republican Party, Terry Starkey, with us. Okay, on, on this side we've got uh, the big troublemaker. As a matter of fact, Corey Norris won the Troublemaker Award a few weeks ago. Founder of the Lexington Tea Party. Founder of what? Founder of the Lex Lexington Tea Party. Uh, also involved with the Republican Party. Uh, I'm sitting in the corner. <laughs> we've got the Ron Paul leadership of the state, uh, Nicole Quinn, over in the corner. Uh, let's see, we've got, well, I'll introduce the other candidates and mention she's going to speak. Uh, we've got Bill Burbage, writes for the Wall Street Journal, letters periodically. And and I will tell you about landing a jet without the front wheels being down. Eddie McCain, he flew for you, I <laughs> and we got Al Denton. You know, and, and Al, if I say retired Army, I'm going to be wrong, right? Right. Okay. Retired Air Force. Air Force, that's right. Okay. <laughs> Army's right here. Army's here. <laughs> Phil Black, all these folks will speak. But first, as usual, the. Oh, oh, yeah. Everybody. It's confusing. Suzanne Moore is running for the third court. Now, she's been here before on the video many times. But, but we'll three. finish it three, three times. Three. She'll have an opportunity to speak. Anybody after the main speakers? Oh, not, you don't want to speak? No. Okay. no I, I want to enjoy the fellowship. Oh, the fellowship. Okay. <laughs> the camaraderie. Okay. So, now Mr. Gettings is going to perform. I'll say that. I don't know what he's going to do exactly, but he's going to perform. Mr. Gettings, you got the floor. First of all, I'm going to employ the three rules of good speaking. If we have three speakers, I'm not one of them. There are three rules to good speaking. Stand up to be seen, speak up to be heard, and shut up to be appreciated. So I'm all that for that. Most of y'all know I am a serious historian, on, uh, in, in addition to a lot of other things I am. But I'm going to tell you, I got talking about music. How many of you remember Shake, Rattle, and Roll and Rock and Roll? Well, you're that old shake, rattling and roll. You young people don't remember that. 
I'm going to tell you all where <laughs> shake, rattle, and roll and rock and roll came from. That's my thing. It's history. Shit. And uh, uh, I thought you might be interested in this. won't take but a minute. I was down at Pinewood, South Carolina. We used to have a possum trot down there. Uh, which also we don't have anymore. Pinewood isn't, isn't even there hardly. But uh, I was down there one day and uh, I used to teach Sunday school and was a deacon in the Baptist church and all, a pretty fairly religious fellow. And uh, some of the young people come to me on the street down there one day and said, Uncle Willie? Uh, everybody calls me Uncle Willie, whether they're kin to me or not. She said, Are you a pretty religious fellow? I said, I don't reckon you care anything for this new music that we got. This is back some years ago. This shake, rattle, and roll, and rock and roll music. I don't reckon you care for that. I said, what are you talking about? Yeah, I love it. They said, you do? I said, yeah, man. I love the shake, rattle, and roll, and rock and roll music. I said, there ain't nothing more religious in the world than shake, rattle, and roll, and rock and roll music. They said, what? I said, come right out of the Bible. I bet y'all didn't know this either. I said, yeah, come right out of the Bible. He said, I don't know about that. I said, you ever heard the story of little David? No, this ain't David James, this is David. <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah, I've heard the story of little David, but I ain't, I ain't never heard about all shake, rattle, roll, rock, and roll. I said, set yourself back, boy. Let me tell you the story of little David, the way I learned it at Pinewood Baptist Church, the Sunday school down there. He said, little David was biding out in the field with the sheep. And his papa come out there where he was, said, hold, David, as they did. <laughs> David said, hold what? Unbeknownst to a lot of folks, little David didn't have all his screws tightened all the way down when he was just a young one. But that was all right. And uh, little, his papa said, little David, said, I want you to take this basket here, what I've prepared, over yonder to your brothers what's dug in fighting with them Philadelphians over there. <laughs> little David said, <laughs> Little David said, but Papa, if I go over there, who's going to buy it here with these sheep? And his Papa said, I is. Now, folks, that's Southern for I am. I may have to translate some of the Southern phrases that I use from time to time for some of y'all what ain't natural habitats of the South, and I'll do that. I think so, everybody in here understands it. Though. So Little David <laughs> taking the basket of goodies and lit off across the hot burning sand. And soon... He came to where his brothers was, and his brother saw him and said, Hold, David. And David said, Hold what? Somebody's always trying to get me to hold something. And his brother said, No. What did I, what did I brought to us? And, uh, David said, I brought you some pickled pig's ears and some sliced pig snouts and some okra and tomato on light bread sandwiches, the kind you have to eat quick lest it fall through the crust. Oh, so brothers rejoiced. Fell upon the goodies and consumed them when the cut store behind them. And likewise, when they had eaten, they went to sleep. Little David stood there a minute or two, and directly he reached over and grabbed his brother and shook him until his teeth rattled. His old brother rolled his eyes. Now that's where Shaky rattled and rattled and rolled first up from right there. <laughs> Little David said, Look here, brothers. How come y'all don't go to sleep and left me here to whip up on, up on these Philadelphians all by my own self? His brother said, man, you ain't going to have to worry about that. They done run a giant in on us. Little David said, you know that there ain't no giant plays on the same team with no Philadelphia. <laughs> his brother said, they do in this game. <laughs> Little David cast his eyes around. Yeah. He didn't see him. He said, well, why he is? I said, for where is he? His brother said, you're going to hear him coming through the bushes any minute. Here he comes now. Choo, choo, choo. <laughs> making that big old step, just great big old giant come up that big club in his head and he walked right up to where little David was. He looked down at him. He said, boy, I'm going to take this club and I'm going to hit you on the head so hard you go home like a ten-penny finishing nail hit with a greasy ball pin hammer. <laughs> little David said, hmm. I ain't scared of none of you. Where my smooth, slim, slick river lock rock? And beloved, he sought diligently and around about thereof, and behold, he came upon a smooth, slim, slick river rock, and he taken it, which the sort of took, placed it in the tongue of a blue suede tennis shoe with two pieces of plow line hooked there and there, and he wound up thusly, ee, 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 
sing, you sing with the wrong shot. The giant, the giant said, oh, because it hurt him. <laughs> and he rolled off in a little valley down there. And that little David pounced upon the giant and relieved him of his coin purse. One of those plastic ones you use. Folks, that's where rock and roll first come from. Little David taking a rock and a roll with the giant. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, you never know what to expect here at the Casey Mafia Breakfast Meeting. But you guys, that was entertaining. I will say that. Had that little light you on where that come from? Well, it's a little religious context, a little uh, rock and roll, all that mixed together. I'm particularly fond of Philadelphia myself. <laughs> well, it's time for our, our first speaker. And uh, the first speaker, this this is, Bill Black's been here before, but uh, Bill, come on up and have it, make a presentation. Let's give Bill Black a hand. Up. There's one thing about it, I cannot do what he did. I'm not an entertainer. <laughs> right. What I want to talk about is where we are today. We're in a mess financially in this country. We actually are to the point where we're one step away from the depression. How do we get there? How do we happen entitlements in this country? We started out with a book called the Bible. Okay? In the Bible, it states that an able-bodied man who don't work, don't eat, We've gotten so far away from that. We're back to where we think we can make everybody happy by providing them with entitlements. That does not work. We have taken the pride away from the average person. How do I know this? Okay. In my life, I've been blessed. I've had a store down in Barmel for 37 years. I worked 36 years with SBA. I started out with, uh, I guess you say, third trainee in the old state room with Hootie Johnson. That's where I should have stayed. Because Hootie, I was his, I guess you say, his little redneck stepson because he had four daughters and I was an old country boy who I could relate with him. So I learned banking, okay, went from there, went, I've got a real estate license, broker's license, I've got a residential contractor's license. To tell you how old I am, I have a number on my residential home builder's license is number 83. So I go way back, I'm an antique. But um, going back to what we're looking at, let's look at the reality of where we are today. The reason I am interested in trying to change is six reasons, grandchildren. I look at the little grandchildren and I say, you know, I really am apologetic. I'm embarrassed at what we have done where we're leaving you. We get back to what happened to us, okay? Um, I was playing on the softball league for the Lake Murray Baptist Church about 12 years ago. And I said, well, you know, I need to get me a fairly decent um, softball club. So I went down and bought one of them. The Spalling Company, which is America's first baseball company, okay? Didn't think much about it, played with it for a few years. Then the other day I was out in the yard, I was catching, teaching Bubba how to play. That's my little seven-year-old grandson to play baseball. Got my glove out, looked at it, and I said, you know, we have got to the point where we don't buy American. There's nothing really being produced in America. Looked at my baseball glove 12 years ago, Taiwan. I wanted to take it back, but it was too late to exchange it. <laughs> but where would we buy a baseball glove made in America today? There ain't one. So how can I relate to this? We have a little store down in Barnum, okay? In the store, when we started back in 75, we had 15 wholesalers calling us. Today, we have four. Home Depot, Lowe's, and whatnot have taken the hardware business. I'll leave here today. I'll spend two hours picking up inventory to get here at the store tomorrow so that we can sell. People come in, and we're looking at a situation where both of our mills are closed in Barmore. There were 843 employees at one time. They're closed. How does that affect the economy in a small town? Okay. One, they paid property tax. Two, they paid a tremendous $800,000 in sewage and water fees per year, plus 800-something people that work there. They're gone. What are they going to do? You look at the reality. Are these people never had entitlements. They work for their living. They were honest, hardworking people. They have a little savings account. They have a little balance on their credit cards. They have a little unemployment check. The unemployment check does not take care of their living expenses. They're maxing their cards out. I see it in the store weekly where they're denied. They're using their savings. Now, what are they going to do? These people, they're going to lose their houses. They're not going to really have food to eat from the standpoint. They're lost. 
Now, you go on the outside of town, the entitlements, third generation, okay? They have a place to live, they have food to eat, they have money to spend, they have a dog on cable vision, and a cell phone. This, my friends, has got to stop. How does it stop? First, drug test. Uh, simple. If you drug test them and they don't pass, then at that point, we stop giving them the entitlements. What the entitlements are doing now, subsidizing the drug trade. I can go to Barbara and get you um, the stamps, 50 cents on a dollar, because they're swapping the, the stamps for money so they can buy drugs. I'll give you a case at hand. I like to always give those stories of reality. My godson's um, wife was a school teacher in Barn, first grade. A little boy in there in the first grade. He really wasn't even housebroken. So, you know, it was really a sad situation. One day he was crying. Paige went to him and said, son, what's wrong with you? He said, my feet hurt. Your feet hurt? He said, yes. So he took shoes off, and it's almost gangrene and set him. What had happened, he was the smallest of eight kids. Only two of them had the same dad. His mother was on crack, living in a house. The water had been cut off for two months, okay? Now, what happens to this kid? His mom's going to jail. Here he is. We have no place to put him. There's no place to put these kids. Foster home is not the answer. There are good foster homes, but a lot of them in for the money, not for taking care of the welfare of the kids. Years ago, there's a school, which is still there, it's not what it used to be, called Della Hare in McCarthy, South Carolina. They had a dairy, they had a garden, they produced everything they did, it was self-sufficient, young ladies. In fact, I also older people remember a boy, Ronnie Lamb, who played ball for Carolina. Ronnie was a product of Delaware. I took Ted McGee and Jimmy Jones up there about three months ago. We're trying to get it where it will be taken over from the state. Anything the government works with is a disaster. The government cannot fix anything. What we have to do is get back to the basics. Everything is a business. Church is a business. Hospitals are a medical business. The government should not be in the business. The government was set up for one thing, that was to protect us from our enemies not to interfere. We look at it from the standpoint, what's the biggest, I guess you say, deterrent in being a small business person? Regulations. Regulations. EPA. Give you an example. Guy came in, I guess about four months ago, once started blueberry um, uh, farming operation. He bought $2,200 worth of irrigation equipment. Went out, set his uh, bushes down, irrigated them. Came up to the um, market here and said, I'd like to sell my blueberries. They said, well, let's see your little certificate card. He said, certificate card? Yeah, you have to be approved so that you can sell your product on the market. I don't have one. So d came out. you got to have a port john you got to have a place to wash your hands and whatnot before you can sell your product. Okay? Get away. He, now, he had a small thing. He only had, I think it was 85 plants. So that goes to point. He said, I ain't doing that. So he didn't sell his blueberries. So he's not in business. So we're looking at corporations. America is the most expensive corporate tax in the world. Okay? South Carolina's number five. All right, taxes hurt big business, but they can pass that on to the consumer. They cannot compete with the EPA. I mean, the other day, the new regulation, you have a disconnect on an outside air conditioning unit. That's so someone comes to work on the air conditioning, they got electricity on. Now they're gonna put you, have you to put disconnect on your burning hot water heater. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It's just silly stuff. So where does it start? There's three things wrong with the federal government. First is greed, and greed's a nasty thing. Then we get into academia. What's academia? That's smart. We look at cash for clunkers. We look at no child left in the <coughs> We look at the stimulus packages. We look at all the things that they look on paper, looks good, but in reality doesn't work. Then the most dangerous of all is what you look at and you call special interest groups. Special interest groups go to lobbyists. There are 13,000 lobbyists in Washington. It's been over 14 million a year to get their situation taken care of. So why are you looking for it? Why are they spending money, okay? Because the government is set up, which to actually deal with the government, you must come in with a lobbyist to get favoritism, okay? Sad situation. We get back to why, how can we stop that? Go back to free enterprise, understand. But what is free enterprise? That's where someone can start a business, have the opportunity to fail. Right now, you get into a big corporation, Look at the solar panels, look at all Chevrolet, the boat, all the things like this have been subsidized by the government and they don't work. We've got to get back to the basics. The 
basis is free enterprise. Okay? And it's not free enterprise whenever you cannot. I've got to have the um, blueberry pack. Do you think veggies coming out of Mexico under the same growing regulations as that guy would do in Barnwell, South Carolina? No, they're not. So we're not competing on a level playing field. Do we get back to the level playing field for the basics? We cannot succeed. So I can go on and on, but what I'd like to do is get questions from you folks so I can try to answer them. Who has a question? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. You, uh, one of the first things you talked about was entitlements. Yes. Um, if entitlements are such a problem, why don't you just try to get rid of them instead of saying, you know, mandating drug tests, why don't you just get rid of them? It goes back to the vote, okay? Why do you think that both Democrats and Republicans are trying to compete for the Mexican vote, okay? If you look at so how did Obama get elected? It wasn't for the country folks, it was for the entitlement areas of big cities. Okay, it, it goes back to that greedy thing, or whenever you have someone, let's make a mistake. When Mike McGrandy, take that for example, Leroy had a farm, had 600 acres on it. He had a family that lived on it. Okay, Elijah, and they had six children. They were sharecroppers. Back in the early 50s, Elijah came to Leroy. He said, Mr. Leroy says, I can go down to Barnum. I can live in a free house. I can get food to eat. I can get monies to spend. And I can go fishing every day. I quit. Three years later, Leroy lost his farm. Okay, go back to that. So you're looking at it from the standpoint, what would you do with all these people? immediately now, living in all these houses and projects if they had no income from the federal government. What's what happened to them? People right now are stealing left and right. I don't know where you have it here, but in Barnwell, if it's not nailed down, copper especially, and everything else, tractors, people are stealing. Because what's happening to most of the average people, they run out of money, okay? So the entitlements, it's gonna take a little while to work out of it, but you're gonna have to have jobs to put these people on. In the store over the last 20, 37 years, we've got four kids come through. It's called an apprenticeship program, okay? We need an apprenticeship program for the kids to come out of high school and college. Because kids coming out of high school right now, there are no jobs available. They have no experience. In fact, we can't find a kid right now that's interested in being an apprenticeship in the store anymore. They're texting, they're doing this, they just have no interest in work. They have no work, work ethics. It's, it's a hard, we, we can get there overnight. It'll take a while, but to get back to it, it's going to have to be jobs. People have got to work. Any other questions? Don't you have to get rid of the um, uh, the uh, minimum wage if you're going to allow people to work for whatever the uh, rate the economy will? The minimum wage is a deterrent from the standpoint. But what you're doing there, I guess you say manipulating the uh, minimum wage, Walmart. If you work 37 hours, you're part-time. Okay, you have no benefits, you know, this type of thing, you don't get unemployment if you quit, this type of thing. So we gotta look at the standpoint. Yes, people will pay, but you've got to be able to afford to pay a certain amount. Some companies can pay seven dollars and twenty-five cents an hour. Farmers and all can pay seven dollars and twenty-five cents an hour. You go back to automation, okay? Because of the cost of living, you went to automation. The farm started. We went from actually and I used to go to Green Day pick up the I call them the pickers and the choppers. Um, to do the cotton. When Elijah left the farm, you had automation, you had cotton pickers, okay? When our <coughs> industry comes back, it's going to be on high tech, okay? It's not going to need, we're going to have robots take place of the uh, <coughs> workers. We've got millions of kids that have no future. So what do we do with them? That's a big question. So we've got to create jobs. We've got to create jobs, and we can do that in a free enterprise. And that means making America from the standpoint. I'd be willing to pay a little bit more for this glove if it were made in America. The quality would be that. Go to the store. We got rid of our key machine in the store. We used to make keys. The blanks are coming from China. And you got a key, um, quick set. Quick set has a certain um, depth on its um, blank. The blanks coming in from China have no consistency. I guess one out of five keys that we cut were wrong because of the quality of the blank which we're trying to cut the from. It ain't pretty out there, and that's like the economy. Oh, look at the jobs, unemployment. If we had a true, true listing of what the unemployment is, it would be devastating. <laughs> On the rolls, you have all the federal, military, of these type of people. I'd like to have a true listing of the private sector unemployment. 
You ever blow your mind? There's no telling. Kids coming out of high school don't have jobs. Only 40% of the people from college last year got jobs. People coming off the unemployment rate record are not counted. Ones that never went on it are not counted. I would say we probably have at least 25 or 30% in the private sector of unemployment. And it ain't going to be any better. The Obamacare was probably the worstest thing that's happened in my lifetime. But us folks in here that don't Medicare, right now we're paying $96.40. In, in 12, we're going to pay $104.20. 13, we're going to pay $120.20. And by 2014, we're going to pay $214 <coughs> for our Medicare. Okay? Now you're going to have to have a supplement to go with it. Most average persons make maybe $800 on Social Security. You take $214 out of that off the top. What are they going to live on? They're going to go to the, we can only have so many people on the entitlements. So we're looking at reality. We have got to get back to the basics. We've got to do it yesterday. And how do we do it? Same thing that I was talking about a while ago. We've got to look at the federal government as a business. Okay? It's got to be a business. If you don't have the money, you can't spend it. In the store, I can't write an OD check, an overdraft, to pay for my materials. I've got to have the money to spend to buy materials. The federal government has to do that, and it's all the basics. They do have the money to spend, they print it. Yeah, the, 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 only, the only way to stop the spending is the, is the end of Federal Reserve. Well, yeah, I agree. The federal well, Reserve as long as you got a Federal Reserve printing up fiat money, Congress is going to keep printing it up, and then that, that deflates the money. And You're right. Eddie, in 1913, the Federal Reserve was established. The dollar's worth a dollar. You know what the dollar's worth today? Three cents. You, uh, you, know, you know if you've seen the line. It is three cents. Three cents. The value of three cents. Now, it's we, a lot less than three cents. I just have to have realized again. <laughs> this is true. We, we actually, in the, um, I guess you say, in the stages of the depression. And we get here, the majority of us, we're going to survive. We are. We don't, we are old enough. We've you know, got most of our stuff paid for and whatnot. We will survive. But the young people don't have a chance. It just, my heart bleeds for them. We've got to come up with some sort of apprenticeship program. We've got to have a place to put these kids. Because parenting is lost. We need a free, a free enterprise. Free enterprise. And we're, we're making it difficult for people to really know. Any other questions, David? Um, well, you're talking a lot about free enterprise, and uh, yet you opposed uh, NAFTA and PAFTA, and I assume the GATT agreement as well, from between the mid-90s and the, the mid part of the last decade, uh, that took tariffs off and freed up free enterprise. How, how is that consistent? How is a free enterprise when you have EPA on regulations that to produce a product? Okay? You look, you're, looking, you're not looking at apples and apples. Okay, you're looking at apples and oranges. If we're going to have a free enterprise, it's got to be free across the board. Do you think you can go to Japan and sell your product? I don't think so. You've got to go through step, 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 and they're going to put all kinds of regulations as far as tariffs and all. You can't even be competitive. They're taking care of their own. Canada does the same thing. Their lumber industry is subsidized. Our people, the foresters, couldn't even compete in selling our lumber because the county <coughs> government was subsidizing the foresters. So you would have supported those international agreements had the had we removed uh, regulations on our end? If, if now, how are you going to do that? It's just like the nuclear well, thing we're talking about. Well, that's not what I asked. The, the question is, would you have supported NAFTA and CAFTA if we had eliminated regulations domestically to make that equal? If the regulations domestically made us competitive <coughs> with the rest of the world, yes. But now, how can you control the rest of the world? Oh, no, so I'm talking about, you were saying that we're, uh, we're unequal because, for instance, environmental regulations uh, you know, make it harder for us to compete with, with other countries. So if, if we limited, limited our domestic regulations, would you support the free trade and, and eliminating no tariffs? And as like long that? as the yeah. domestic regulations are not academic, okay? You look at academia, <laughs> it's not realistic. All right. I, I grew up with my granddad. I rode between two mules while he plowed. But the folks who here to that buffet out there was the well behind the house. 25-foot well. We had drank the water. None of us got sick. It was a refrigerator. Another 50 feet was the animal house. Then you had this um, house which was smoked. So I'll put smoke stuff in there for the ham and all. So those regulations, could you look at regulations? Could Noah build the ark today? 
with the regulations we have? I don't think so. You know, from the standpoint, we've gotten so academically involved until the point where we're not being practical. Okay. You know, I have one question. Yes, ma'am. Why are you running against my husband? Why am I running against your husband? <laughs> I went through all my steps. Okay, okay, especially one about immigration, illegals. Okay, and Joe said, "Phil, I'll do something about it." He didn't. So I said, from the standpoint, if you're not going to do it, Joe, then let me get a chance to try to do it because we've got to change. Joe's been there since um, 2001. Okay, and we look at it from the standpoint, what has Joe put on the table to change where we are at this point? Tell me one regulation. I'm not aware of any regulation. Or one of his bills that will take care of us as far as free enterprise and take care of the entire I know, I know Joe is working hard to bring jobs to the, to the district. What's he doing? <laughs> Don't pin me down. No, well, you, you're pinning me down. Oh, oh, down. Arrest, uh, a Amoresco. Um, well, look what they did from the standpoint of the small business. Small business apply, um, employs 80% of the people in this country. Okay? 80% of the people are by small business. You go down to Aiken, you look at the billboards, they're vacant now. You look at the shopping centers, yeah, they're Phil, vacant. Any, you can do that in any town, any small town in the, in the state. You don't have to pick out. Aiken, we started out Lair Culture. We started out Lair Culture, right? The average age of a farmer today is 59 years old. Okay? That's pretty old to be an average age of somebody producing your food. Mm -hmm. We lost our farming basically from the standpoint of the way it used to be. Then we lost our manufacturing. <coughs> look at small towns, they're ghost towns. They started losing their agriculture, became goats, back of farming and all left. Then the mills left. Okay? So you, you don't think Joe's a good congressman? Didn't say that. Joe's a good person. Joe's an excellent person. I like Joe as an individual. What I'd like to see Joe do is put some bills on the table that would give us master basics. Simple. And he told you he wouldn't do it? Didn't say he wouldn't. He told uh, Bush to write it down. And Bush didn't even have a pen. And I'll tell you what it was. Well, I'll write no, it I'll down. go back to the end of Russia. Illegal. My theory was this. Well, Phil, you've run twice against you. I did. You, this, I is the third time, this is third time. And so third you've, gone through 10, you've gone through $10,000 filing I did. to run for Congress. I did. And nobody gave me a penny. It's out of my pocket. In fact, my check today for 3480 is not coming out of PAC. It's coming out of my personal check account. Mm -hmm. That's how bad I, I guess you say how committed I am to get to the point to try to do something. When I die, I will at least say I tried it. Okay. okay? I'll give you that. Okay. Thank you. But I, but, I, but I also want you to know that my husband works hard. Didn't say that. No, I want. I, I, but no, but I want you to realize that Joe Wilson is one of the hardest working people in this state, working for you and everybody here. And you. Joe told me I didn't understand. Every 15 months, he has to run for re-election. Exactly. He's spending his time running for re-election. If you were doing the fantastic job you're supposed to, you wouldn't have to worry about raising three million dollars to run again. People would vote for you doing the great job. Well, they do vote for him, and he will get reelected. I don't vote for him. Who said that? I do. I don't. I don't either. I don't vote. I'd like to know why he voted for, for the National for Defense Authorization Act. Yeah. That's a complete wipeout of the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, it's like complete. Okay, no, I mean he, he he's made some horrible, horrible. Horrible Joe, books. Catholic, Eddie, 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 I appreciate, Tar Eddie, I appreciate uh, you telling me that. I'll put that out in your area and tell everybody in Batesburg, Leesville, that you don't support Joe Wilson. And we'll see if that helps let's, you in your election. Let's, let's, uh, let's give Rob Phil a hand, folks. <laughs> 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 right. Next, we have Christine Cox running for school board in Lexington, Lexington County. And Christine was here once before. This is her first formal presentation, so Christine. Everything's good, everyone. Everyone likes you here. Okay. <laughs> Let's give her a hand. Good morning, everyone. My name is Christine Cox. I'm running for school board, Lexington One School District. Uh, short history on me. I graduated from College of Charleston with a degree in philosophy and from Johnson and Wales University with a degree in food and beverage management. I'm a veteran of the U.S. Army and I served in Desert Storm overseas. In 2003, I served on the board of directors for the uh, League of Women Voters of South Carolina. In 2007 and 2008, I was co-leader of the Holistic Moms Network um, business chapter. And within that, I started their preschool co-op, which still functions today. 
I volunteered as a teacher's aide at Pilgrim Community Preschool for the two years that my children attended there. And in 2003, when my family and I decided to build a house in, in the Columbia area, we chose Lexington because of its beauty and charm, which I love, and because Lexington One is, I, I believe, the best school district uh, in the state. Now, as far as why I'm running, I don't have a particular personal agenda besides that I believe that the uh, making the district, I like to make the district the best it can be, and continue to improve. Uh, and the basics, the area of the basics, um, the academics, and so on. I intend to live here the rest of my life, and I believe the role of community is to be involved in its future, which is the schools. I'd like to see the schools accomplish the following. Pay down the debt. This is something that Phil was just talking about, our debt. Um, we're currently $353 million in debt in Lexington One School District. That's $2,916 per citizen. Each individual citizen I'm talking about. Everyone who has kids in school, who doesn't have kids in school, um, elderly, children, everyone. I like to see administrative salaries capped and cut, actually. Um, I like to see us stop hiring Chinese-owned companies to do our construction. Uh, it's not the role of government to create jobs, but it is the role of government to support the Americans and our community. I'd like to see us, as a school district, get back to the basics. Um, the Centers for Advanced Studies are a wonderful idea. They're the, the idea of <clears throat> giving kids an edge and going into college or into the workforce is a great idea. But from what I understand, half the school day will be taken out by this. Children do their core subjects in the morning, and after lunch, they can go to the Centers for Advanced Studies on campus or be bused at taxpayer expense to the Center for Advanced Studies of their choice. Um, then they are transported back to the original school to be their bust or driven home or whatever they did. Um, that ties in with our graduation rate. This reduction of time in the core subjects, I believe, will hurt the graduation rate in a way that time is not spent, enough time is not spent on it. I'd like to see a 90% graduation rate through children's incentives that are not taxpayer funded uh, in a specialized way, but more broadly, there's Civil Air Patrol, like Phil's talking about apprenticeship programs. This, I think, are wonderful reasons for kids to, kids to stay in school and a viable way to prepare them for life after high school. I believe my presence on the school board will bring a, a different viewpoint and a new voice to speak out for maintaining high standards in the face of budget problems. So if anyone is interested in volunteering to help with the campaign, I'm accepting volunteers. And um, donations are most humbly accepted as well. Thank you very much. Recently, I read, and I cannot remember the legislature's name, that suggested that we tie driver's licenses oh, to. Awful. I'm sorry? That was awful. Awful. I was wondering how you felt about that. Getting your driver, keep, you know, you could get a driver's license provided that you stay in school, but if you dropped out of school or you left school, driver's license no. would be required. Yeah, I'm not sure about that because there are so many different reasons, personal, individual reasons, why a person, why a child would not finish high school. Um, there could be problems in the home, there could be problems with an individual, um, they could be homeschooled. What about homeschooled children? I mean, well, they, they, prove they, they, they have to prove that they're in a, an educational environment. But I just wondered, I, when I read it, I was, I was kind of taken back that anybody would come up with a plan. I was just interested in 
they got that done in the in Europe. I'm not sure about that because I think that that's some governmental control over individual choice. Yeah, yeah, so that's why I wouldn't necessarily support that without further research. Okay. We have a question. When I was on the school board, I tried to get them to, I guess, to consolidate the five districts into three. Mm -hmm. anywhere. I also got them to build the same building twice, okay? Save $600,000 of construction, okay? When I look at this standpoint, I try to get into the state that we need two types of buildings, one for level, one for high ground. Same thing. We're paying architects to, you know, anywhere from 6 to 10% fees to design a building which does the same thing as the previous building did, okay? So we got to look at it from the standpoint, it's an educational business. Look at the fees. The building doesn't educate the child, the teachers. Like That's I've right. said so many times, 72% of our property tax goes to school. Only 42% get to the classroom. That's, That's got to change. I will support any uh, improvement in spending um, that I can. And uh, I agree that the fancy buildings don't do anything. I was speaking to Deborah about um, the, the fancy schools and such. And we agreed that if you want landscaping, uh, for instance, have the kids uh, have a horticulture club. Have the kids do it, I mean, as for, for credit. Do. You don't pay a landscaping company. That's what we used to do. Have the kids do it. Uh, one more question. Anyone else have a question? Okay. Thanks, Christine. Okay. Thank you. It's, it's, again, you can see it's always entertaining because you never know what's going to happen with questions and it's, it's this very dynamic, fluid situation. Well, next we have Clay Burkett. Clay was an uh, ex patrolman, right? He was a highway patrol. State Transport Police. State Transport Police. Okay. We're going to tell you about that. Come on up. Get on. I thought you said sit back down. Now, come on up. Uh, this, this is Clay's first time here, folks. So uh, let's give him a, a, a warm welcome and thank you for coming on. Yeah, I, I follow orders well. I thought he said sit back down, and I was sitting back down. <laughs> but, uh, my name is Clay Burkett. I'm from Leesville. Uh, born and raised in Leesville. Uh, my parents, and well, it goes back a long ways to the 1700s. My family's lived in Lexington County, mostly in that end. And we branched out a little bit because we got there from local CPAs that his cousins of mine. But um, I went to Batesburg Leesville High School, graduated in 77, and uh, after graduating, I loafed around a little bit. I didn't go to college right off. I was 30 before I went to college. But I, I, I kind of did a little better. I was on the dean's list then. But um, I went into law enforcement in 1979 in Batesburg. I started off as a city police officer and I worked through there. And, uh, I went to work for Governor Campbell in 1992. Worked for him for four years until he left office. and. From there, I went to uh, State Transport Police, and I retired in 2006 uh, from the State Transport Police. And uh, at the moment, my brother and I run a tile business. We install ceramic tile, remodel bathrooms. And, uh, got a little website there. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> got a <an> car. <laughs> yeah, got a car too. <laughs> but uh, I'm running for car, and uh, I know that's not real exciting. I know. When you're running for Senate or school board and different things, you know, people can really get behind that. And you say, Carter, they say, I don't know if I'm going to talk to you on the <laughs> you know, And nobody wants to see the Carter, and I understand that. I don't want to see the Carter come to the house. That's not, uh, you know, one of the big things that you look at and you see that somebody walking up the door, that's not a, not a good sign. And uh, I've had to deliver a few of those messages over my law enforcement career. And, it's not a good thing. Uh, you do the best you can with the information you got. And uh, I think it's time for a change uh, in Lexington County and Carter. Uh, President Carter has been there since 1977, the year I graduated high school. Uh, like I said, since then I've, I've run a full law enforcement career. And uh, right here in Lexington County for the majority of it. I did work for uh, a couple years in Calhoun County as a deputy sheriff. I worked real close with the coroner in Calhoun County. 
And I, I told Steve this story before. Mr. Carter in Calvin County at the time, his name was Hoyt Schuler. Mr. Hoyt was a real nice fellow. He was a golf pro at the Calvin Country Club. He had one arm. And he played golf better with one arm than most people play with two. Uh, but, uh, we never did go on the ride with Mr. Hoyt when he was going on a call. Because he called him on the radio, he's trying to drive. He's trying to answer the radio and the car's all over the road. So you, you want to pay attention when you're with Mr. Hoyt. Didn't let him drive, you could help him. But, uh, he was a nice fellow. We worked close with him for several years while I was in Calvin County. Uh, I'm certified by the state as an investigator, as a police administrator. Uh, like I said, I did my time in public safety. 27 years, and like I said, the majority right here in Lexington County. I'm a homegrown fella. Uh, going to stay here the rest of my life. I'm not going anywhere. You know, whatever it takes, I'm going to still be in Lexington County. I'm a property owner, and I pay my taxes like everybody else does. I better they come and get it. So, uh, but if uh, when you go out there and you see the sign that says Clay Burkett, uh, you can look at that sign now and you say, well, I saw that fella. <laughs> and, uh, not in, in a bad way. <laughs> I wouldn't write you a ticket or anything like that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing all the time. I like to think that tickets help save lives. And that's what I think our highway patrol and our public safety folks are good at. They're good at saving lives out here. Our fire department, they're good at saving lives. Um, but I think it's time for a change in Lexington County. And I think I'm the man for the job, and I appreciate any support. Any questions? Was yes, the sir. difference in a highway patrolman and a transport? The you state transport police is responsible for uh, enforcing the commercial vehicle laws. Big trucks, tractor trailers. Oh, okay. They're, as far as authority, they have the same authority as the highway patrol. They're part of the Department of Public Safety. Uh, oh, it's your own. I got a brother retired from the highway patrol, too, right here in Lexington County. Clay, did you now you work with B, my buddy B.I. Metcalf, right? Yes, I did. Okay, I just feel yeah. sorry for you. I, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. He's one of my attorney brothers. Okay. And I just want to congratulate you on having two arms. I think you would make a nice. Well, thank you very much. I'm not much at golf, though. So. Okay. <laughs> Even better. Clay. Yes, sir. Um, Saving lives. Is that. Is that no, sir. No, sir. Um, Transport officers save lives. I think as uh, saving lives comes down to your, your highway patrol, city police, sheriff's departments, EMS, fire departments. Um, they do a great job out here working these highways day in and day out, um, helping to save lives. I think by the time the car gets a call, it's a little bit late to save a life. <laughs> now, right. there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with, you know, talking to folks and, you know, and enlightening them on certain things. But I think it's the coroner's job itself, as defined by law, is uh, not in the same context as saving lives. You mentioned that, that now it's time for a change in the coroner's office. Why is that? Well. Um, the biggest change that I think you need is uh, he's 77 years old. Known him all my life just about. Doesn't get around real well. Doesn't drive real well. I do. <laughs> I get real I, I get away get around well. I'm a matter of fact I'm a certified driving instructor. I I, I taught uh, pursuit driving and precision driving at the police academy for basic classes. I get around pretty good. I might be a little big, but I still move pretty good. Yes, sir. I, I'm just curious, are there any certain medical knowledge requirements needed for a coroner? I would imagine the there would be, but I'm not sure what the The coroner's office is an investigative agency. They investigate the matter of the That's it. There is such a code, and you have to swear by it after they are. There's strict guidelines. Strict. Very strict guidelines, no doubt. But as far as medical, I've done just as many autopsies as any other coroner in South Carolina. Well, that's what I was fixing to ask. When you do the autopsies and all that, zero. Coroner's office does. They're not part of that process. No, sir. 
We know which one you did. That's enough for folks to do that here. We're going to have any questions. Any more questions? I saw your sign yesterday, and I'm so, I'm the first one I thought, I didn't know I didn't know you were running, so I am just doubly blessed today to, well, to actually eyeball you. So you're right about that. It's nice to see the sign with the person. Well, that, I hope that works. <laughs> That's a good plan. I appreciate folks. it. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes our featured speakers. Uh, but as always, we have time for anyone who wants to make a few comments. You want to say anything? No, I'll make my speech two later, weeks. Later, two weeks, okay. Anyone else? That, uh, Suzanne, you sure you don't want to say anything? No, I just want to remind everybody that uh, although um, that person right there and I are related, I am running my own race. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> and I hope no one on that side of the room or, or this side of the room holds it against me. I am just <laughs> 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 I hope no one on that side of the room holds it America, these are things we can't control. Some of these things that happen. We have to edit this part out. <laughs> but, ahead, I, really, I really came to invite everybody to the campaign headquarters opening at 636 Sunset Boulevard at 10 o'clock this morning. Also, Phil, we talked so much about grandchildren last week. I walked out, uh, as I was walking out the door, this was on the side as I walked out the door. So I wanted to show y'all uh, half of our grandchildren. They have six, we have six and two thirds. So, <laughs> but but they, these are uh, two of our boys and the, here's our princess. Um, Emily Ruth, Addison and Houston. And um, I wanted to tell y'all that um, I know some of you had some derogatory remarks about Joe. But honestly, no one works harder than my husband. And uh, anything you can do uh, for you people that, that do know Joe would certainly appreciate your support. And come by the headquarters at 10 o'clock this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank I you. do support my sister, and I ask you to support her also. <laughs> Even if she is ugly toward me. I didn't mean I didn't mean oh, I, I did not mean it's to imply me. anything, but I am my own person and I have my own feelings and my beliefs and I I vote my conscience like all many of and, you do. And I will tell you, we also each individual is, is an individual and choose their own course of life and I respect your comments. I mean we all do. Mm -hmm. Ross, you wanna say something? No. Mr. Burks does. Mr. Uh oh, now Mr. Burks. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Burks, I'd, like, I'd oh. like to ask you: okay. Is Social Security a Ponzi scheme? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Ross, yeah. Yeah, all right. Is anyone else want to say something before we ignite the stick of dynamite called Ponzi scheme? Oh, Charlie Ponzi, what? Hey? Okay. okay. <laughs> That's a serious question. Steve, you want to say anything you have anything to say? Or? Um, yeah, I'd just like to say. Um, I asked the question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead, Mr. Burton. You've got the floor. Go ahead. Let me ask you a question. Just ask your question. She probably is Social Security the fund? Um, yeah. I am I just started taking I just got my first Social Security check. I, yeah, I guess it is. Careful. It is. But I want mine too. It is. <laughs> right. But Thank nobody you. talks about it. This government stole two and a half trillion dollars of American people's savings and spent it on something else. Which is why every working American in here, their first priority is to pay for my Social Security and my medical care. 15.3% of the damn near total payroll comes to me. Does anybody suppose that has anything to do with a 10% unemployment? That's the biggest cause of unemployment in this country. My first priority is paying my payday lender back. By the way, neither does anybody else in this state. I gave Alan Wilson a, a, an advertisement for a payday lender when he was here a few weeks ago. And he took it and folded it and put it in his pocket. I said the real interest rate on this loan is not 390% per annum. It's 3,723% per annum. And I got $10,000 anybody that thinks that's wrong. Gee, I, wish I don't know what he did with it. He put it in his pocket. I love my friend Mr. Burbage. But I disagree on that. Let me say a word and I shut up. Okay. Our government did not steal the money. They loaned it to the United States government. How are they, how are they going to pay it back? And the government went broke. How are they going to pay it back? We're broke. We can't. 
That's exactly right. So that's what you call stealing. But it was not a Ponzi scheme. It was a bad decision. A bad hey, decision. Bill, can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Is the state retirement system in the state of South Carolina a Ponzi scheme? I don't know anything about the state of South well, Carolina. Well, if you die, yes. if, you, if, you, if you turn whatever age and you die, do you get, a, do you get another check after you die? I don't know anything about it. No, I don't I'm, know I'm, talking about you, it. The answer is no. So what is it? They're kidding. I don't hey, know anything this, about it. This, I do know something about Social Security. But what I'm saying, that money's invested too. But do you get another check? No. Uh, I don't the answer know. to that's no. I don't know. So Not does that make that a Ponzi scheme? I don't know. I don't know a damn thing about it. What what program is that? It's the state, state of South Carolina. State, state, state retirement. My brother oh, is on state retirement. You know, maybe yeah, but if he dies, he doesn't get another check. I doubt well, that, it. That's not what makes it a Ponzi scheme. What yeah. makes it a Ponzi so scheme you is the fact that you don't invest. When you don't have investments paying for benefits. Right. Ponzi set out to to be schemed with yeah. a scheme to take people's money and not give them nothing. Their Social Security did. Yeah. David, you they say that the state very retirement sound is not a Ponzi scheme? And people like yeah. Joe Wilson yeah. voted so for to help the people and they loan the money to, There's the, no to, the, uh, to the government people. and the government went broke. The, what, 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 what makes Social Security a Ponzi scheme is that the, uh, like, like other Ponzi there, schemes, there's it's no paid debt. off by present uh, contributors. The there is no the such thing invest. as a retirement plan that does not involve saving and investing. There yeah, isn't in South Carolina. Carolina it's it's called a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, but it's saved and invested, guys. But you're not you're not listening to what I'm telling you. I don't know what you're talking about. If you're I'm talking state. about Social Security. You're talking about state retirement. I don't know what that's <laughs> about. Well, state I want retirement. you to investigate this, Bill, because you're good at that. But <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you, David, is that if you die and you're on state retirement, do you get another check? No. But that doesn't make it a Ponzi scheme. What, what, then what is it then? Because if, the, if my wife is paid in two hundred thousand dollars to the retirement system and she drops dead at 60, 62 or sixty-two and a half years old, and she gets never gets another check, they've taken her two hundred thousand dollars. So where's my money? Well, I'm not defending that. I'm just saying that's not what a Ponzi scheme. You can do a Ponzi scheme. You can set it up. No, I know what you can do. You set up a beneficiary. But normally, yeah, if you don't, if you have, don't set up as a beneficiary, you don't get it's technically check. a Ponzi scheme. Mm -hmm. you don't get Even if that money's invested, the person does not receive future benefits as a Ponzi scheme. Now, now that's not what a Ponzi scheme is. A Ponzi scheme. This little lady wants to say something. Y'all hush. Will you pay off? All right, folks. Uh, present. She's quiet, but she wants but, to say something. But David, you are doing that. <laughs> With that let money, me, let me respond. All right, you're right. paying other people off. Hang, hang on, y'all. Let's work with it. Let's take five more minutes. We're gonna stop this. Yeah. Steve, you gotta say something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. First, I know yeah. it's yeah. not a. I know it's not a trick question. If you die, do you get another check? Because obviously you're dead. You don't. So you have the options. Um, I chose to take all of mine and not leave it to a beneficiary because I had more money. And my, I figured my husband didn't need it, and his second wife sure as heck wasn't going to get it. <laughs> um, but it's according to your option. But if if you, I die today, and my check's supposed to go in like April 1st, I, it will not go in my account. I chose that option, and you know, within three years, um, I drew back, withdrew more than I had put in. So, no, and I'm sorry for laughing, I thought you had a trick question. If you died, you get another check. But that's what the rules are. So the state retirement system is supported in part by every taxpayer in the state? Because um, state you, employees, you've already taken out more than you put in. State employees put in. Well, and the and the so employer matches. But if you're not state, if you're not state retiree, people never work for the state. Your tax dollars are good to supplement. Well, and and here's the here's the sure. paradox of that. About that one day. The employee puts in money. The employer matches. Well, and if I say we well, well, that's employer, okay. Employer. Except the employer is the state. So in effect, your tax dollars are putting in yeah. seven point yes. one percent. They're putting in all of it. But you gotta have employees. Yeah. You well, know, the your state's gotta have employees. The state employees Why? are employees of the state, so taxpayers pay it. Yeah. Fire them all. Yeah. Okay. Where's Corey? Corey, help me. 
What's up, Bill? Are, are you are you good now, Bill? Bill, you got your message out. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's stop that conversation. Steve, what can we have to say? Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, it's not going to take long. I just wanted to, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Stephen Skagel. Um, I'm Christine Cox's campaign manager uh, for a campaign for school board this year. Uh, Christine had to run out early to get to work. But if anybody has any questions about the campaign, anything they want to know about Christine, where she stands on the issues, anything like that, uh, feel free to come by and talk to me after this. Uh, and also, as Christine said, we do need money. Um, as Mrs. Wilson knows, you can't win unless you get some money and, and some support from the people. So uh, if uh, any of you would like to contribute uh, to our campaign, I'd be happy to accept that as well. So thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other comments from anyone? Any, any more? I'd, I'd like to. All right, let's go. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. I'd just like to say just a, a couple things about uh, that proposed bill to uh, take away the license, uh, license privileges, driving privileges from students that drop out of school. Um, I think that, that uh, one of the natural rights that's not in our Constitution, but it's still a natural right without which I believe in, is the right of uh, transportation, I mean the right of travel, being able to move around. And uh, when people drop out of school, I don't think you should take out any of, take away any of their natural rights. Uh, school should be uh, something that's in, under the uh, necessity of being improved so that it will be more, uh, so it won't be necessary to force people to continue. There have always been people who dropped out, and of course they have, some of them have legitimate reasons. But uh, just to like cut them off at the knees to say this product isn't satisfying you, but you have no options. We own you. Uh, you're part of our chattel. We're going to have to pay taxes one day. We, we're going to take care of you from cradle to grave. It's all part of a mindset that the government owns people, and I think they really do have the right to make their own decisions, and especially to be able to I agree with you. I'm the oldest of 13 children, and I'm the only one that graduated from high school. Now, my family would have been in dire straits if they wouldn't let you have a driver's license. Yeah. The rest of them meant to drop out and go to work. Yeah, I, have I, I, I merely asked the question to find out where somebody that's running for school board stands on something. Mm -hmm. that the the legislature yeah, the I don't think that's a good thing. And it, and it deals with something yeah. that's... That people have to forget different that whole ideas about. So I'm, I, I'm I, I agree with you, but I also think incentives help young people whose brains haven't developed yet. That's yeah, true. When, you, when they lose something, if they if they quit school and they lose something, let, let's weigh this. Well, well, they they might say it's well, should, shouldn't that be for the parents yeah. to do? I mean, yeah. if yeah. you're yeah. in high school and you're under 18, the parents are responsible. I don't believe in the state of the local parentis. You have your own parents, and the state should assert that or try to get a cell phone. That'd be even better. Well, and still, the parents, if you're under age, you have to sign right. Is that still? But I agree with what Sam that it's a great incentive for kids. And one of my bosses just got an award for the dropout prevention. So anything that we can do, and and let's face it, we got some parents who really don't care. So if we can use this as, as a incentive to stay in school, then I, I agree with that bill. Let me just say on a personal note, uh, I have a GED, but I also have a master's degree in international management. So I'm one of those people that uh, couldn't take it anymore. I refused to take the, uh, the exam in advanced algebra because I said I didn't learn anything. So I was an outlier in the way in the way these things come out, but they're all different kind of people. And I don't think it should be that. Okay, Mr. Alden. Um, I lived 17 years overseas, okay, and I lived with people and stuff like that. The biggest incentive to get kids to do better in school is the parents. If your kid brings a C home, be horrified, because the Japanese parents are horrified. That's an insult to the grandparents, okay? And as soon as the mothers and fathers of this country take that attitude, the kids will start going back. 
good, that's a good point. Any other comments before we officially stop? <coughs> okay, I think was, we had a great uh, session today. We have filing that starts at 12 o'clock. And uh, Mickey Linder's chairman of our filing committee. Mickey, you want to say anything? Um, just that there, um, for coroner and sheriff, will have the affidavit forms that they must sign, that they, they go by the code, and I have a copy of the code. We have copies of all the filing fees. Um, we have forms for everybody. Um, I think we're completely set up. Um, um, the, chairman, the chairman will report to the media. That, that's the rule I followed, that we should not do it. We'll turn everything over to him, and he'll report to the media. Also, Basically, that's it. for the canvas, if you go to scgop.com forward slash filing, the entire procedure is listed there. All the documents are listed. So they're all in line, and the process is very straightforward. So. And the House and the Senate already have their forms. Um, and it, it, here it should just take about 10 minutes at most. And as you know, school board files in August, not now. Well, and if any of you are members of the party and would like to come help volunteer from now through the 30th, I'm sure Please. we'll have more volunteers <laughs> in space. Well, so again, thank you for coming today, and you can stay and chat. And uh, 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock. Okay. 6.36 Sunset. Okay. Is that a different location than the one he's had over there? And no parking over there. We ain't gonna park. There's plenty of parking. You can park behind. There you go. Is that a new location? No, it's the old old location. It's not the one from last year. Say me a play. But <laughs> one last year on State Street. It's not on State Street. It's no, on but there's one on uh, 378 also. Yeah, but it's not the congressional office. It's campaign office. Next to the Mexican yeah. restaurant, a Mexican. Yeah. Up, yeah, up you can't run this campaign out of the Up the chicken plant. you got yeah. two offices over there. Right, saying that's the old MR Realty building right Yeah, there. it's right next door to MR. All right, folks, thanks. Uh, thanks. It's on Green Hill, where Sherman City. Thanks, America. Thanks, Ron. It, it is. Right over behind? Uh-huh.